Hey guys, I'm Mitch Stocker and welcome to Life in the Peloton. Well, here we are, two weeks post the Vuelta, and I'm just about recovered. I'm just about to go into the, the World Championship, so I hope I'm recovered, because that's going to be a long day too. And what a grand tour it was. It really, really was a tough one. Thanks for tuning in over the last three weeks. I hope you enjoyed the mini-series I did with our freshman, Logan Owen. He certainly got through in the end. There were some rough patches around Stage 9, Stage 10. And to be honest, I didn't know if he was going to make it, but... In the end, he got there comfortably. The final week of the Vuelta was a really big wrap up for us as a team. We had Sergio Guita who won the stage, who sort of put the icing on the cake for us as EF Education first had a really tough tour. We were still working away at things even though it didn't look like that on the outside and Sergio who was amazing in stage 19 took that victory out there which was which was fantastic. I've got to say also thanks to everyone out there who was wearing the t-shirt, wearing the merchandise, supporting me on the side of the road. Everything like I've said before is going back into this pod and I really do appreciate everyone who's supporting the podcast because it's allowing me to record these epis and getting some help along the sides. So thanks again for that too. Now I've got some questions that were sent in that Logan and I didn't really get to answer and in hindsight I wish I'd done a little wrap up with Logan and we could have addressed some of that stuff but as the race got harder and harder we just in the end didn't have time or the energy. So there's a couple of questions here. One of the questions came in was what is it like in the peloton when something is going down? Do you know the situation? What are your thoughts when you found out what after what had happened? So I think what they're referring to here is, you know, someone's attacking on the front. You don't know what's going on. You just hear it in the radio. You can feel the speed of the peloton speeding up and something might be going on. Well, this is my reaction to it anyway, because often it's on a climb or something like that. And I'm not quite at the front of the peloton at those moments. And you can just feel the tension in the bunch go it's one, the pace goes up, but the tension of the pace and the, the, the riders changes. Everyone goes from sitting two or three abreast to suddenly singling out, and you're like, what the hell's going on here? And often you're listening to your radio, or you might even, I might even ask in the radio, what's going on, who's attacking? And you might get some feedback there, or you might just wait till the, the road turns a little bit or whatever, and you can sort of look up ahead and see what's happening and see who's attacking, and then quite start working out what's going on occasionally you'll just be completely dumbfounded and be like, why is AG Tuara attacking right now? Or why is another team, F French team, FDJ, pulling on the front right now? And that could be just simply because they're trying to hold in their tour, grand tour general classification GC. And something like that you just haven't thought about. And you're like, why is this going ridiculously hard right now? And that can be the reason, which takes you a little while to work out. Another question, great question that came in was, on stage 19, Roger Lee got caught up on a crash and Movistar attacked and drilled it for a few kilometers. Can you take us through what actually, what it's actually like in the peloton when something controversial like that is going down? And is there any, any implications afterwards? Well, this is a funny one because actually I was riding the front group that day and I was just positioning myself to be in the front for that small descent and a, you know, what I heard was a very narrow bridge. Logan and myself were right at the front. We're trying to move Sergio and Danny up to the front too. But those guys got caught a little bit back and as it turned out, being at the front wasn't the safest position. But both Logan and I got through that crash. We went on the bridge and there was a little bit of a pause there and we looked around and we thought, what's going to happen here? And I think what happened there was Movistar had the plan anyway to put it in the crosswind at that moment. It was a very dangerous point, single, narrow bridge. And they looked around at each other and went, well, this is our plan, let's go ahead with it. Um, I'm not too sure if they knew that Roglic was down. They knew there was a crash. And as it turned out, I was just trying to follow the wheels. At that moment, I was a bit like, yeah, right. There has been a crash. Is this the right thing? And I was a bit torn what to do. But actually, in the end, I just followed the wheels because I was like, well, I, I better just at least have one of us from up here, from us up here. It is a bit of a funny situation because 
Yeah, it's one of those unspoken rules, which I feel like a lot of, more than not, it's happening now where the race is just going ahead and a lot of guys are overlooking this unspoken rule that happened between the peloton years before. And I've noticed that even in my career, drifting away, whether that's when everyone takes a piso, no one attacking, now people still attack a little bit. Or in a situation like this, you know, I think maybe years before there was just completely no racing and everyone waited for everyone to get back leaders jersey got back and it was a big crash whether the leader was there was was there or not there was a bit more control so whether it was this situation or just general situations in general i'm noticing a lot less respect in the peloton in these kinds of situations not necessarily directing that at movistar but just in terms of how everyone races now everyone wants to try and take the extra edge and that means letting these unspoken rules go out the window a little bit. It is a little bit sad, to be honest, but it's the way that it's going. But today, to get onto today's podcast, we've taken a little bit of a change in direction. This time, someone who's no longer in the pro peloton, but still very much involved in the cycling world. Christian Meyer, who is an ex-teammate of mine, we rode together for four years on Orica Green Edge, a fantastic pro himself who achieved many great highs throughout his career. is a very, very interesting guy and is very well known in Girona for being one of the first to bring specialty coffee to the cycling mecca. I really enjoyed chatting with Christian. I have enjoyed chatting with him over the years since he's retired, but also we had a great connection when him and I were both, you know, pros together. So... It's fantastic to listen to his transition out of out of pro racing and what he's been able to achieve. But also what I found most interesting was how he's able to apply his professional cycling mentality or professional sporting mentality into the, let's say, everyday working world. It's something that I'm really interested in because I know that that's going to be the reality for me in a few years. And I want to pick his brain in does it really work? Can you apply that cycling mentality to the real world and does it work? And he gives me the answers to that in what he's experienced. So this is one of the best podcasts I've really enjoyed recording. So guys, you're breaking some news on there as well. Sit back and really enjoy this one. It's a bit of a change up from some racing talk. Here we go. Christian Meyer. Enjoy guys. Here we are in Girona with my good friend, Christian Meyer, my ex-teammate from Green Edge, but continual mate here in Girona. We don't run into each other too much anymore, but when we do, it's always a laugh. So good family, day. Family life and work life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know at one point there, you were the busy guy and I was laughing because you, you were out there working, you know, building up your businesses and I was like, yeah, mate, you're missing the dream. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I had two kids, and now you're laughing. And now I'm just chilling, <laughs> just chilling, doing nothing. Well, we're sitting here. We've we both got a, a cup of coffee, which is our both of our loves. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk to you today about is this big thing, transition out of professional cycling. Um, and I think it's a, it's a question that a lot of guys choose to ignore, when they become pro and all of a sudden they've retired or they're out of contract and suddenly they're hit with this this reality shock of, wow, the dream is over and now what the hell am I going to do? It's actually very crazy. I mean, like you said, I think so when I saw it comes to the end of end of coming to the end towards the end of my career, seeing, I think one thing that really hit me was in the last couple of years, when I would see guys, you know, obviously in the very tail end of their career, you know, still sort of completely sort of ignoring the fact that the end was coming, yeah. right? And cycling being what it is. I mean, it, all it takes in cycling is, is one bad transfer year, one team folding, just one shit year of 
results, you have an injury, and you're only as good as your last race. That's the thing in bike riding. Yeah. So you may find yourself out of a contract before you had thought you might. And I remember seeing a few of those cases and sitting there at the dinner table, you know, seeing a grown man cry mm. and then be angry and all these sorts of emotions that came along with sort of the end of his cycling career, which is realistically such a small portion of your life. I mean, realistically, a career is a very small portion. I mean, mm-hmm. you go mid, late thirties. Okay. But yeah. like, what do you expect? It's not a, not a life, not a lifelong career, but one of these emotional roller coasters I saw guys going through, I was like, this is insane. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Like you maybe had another year, you know, and what was it about that one more year that was going to be different all mm-hmm. of a sudden that wasn't going to ha- ha- that you weren't going to have the reaction when you stopped? Mm-hmm. And that kind of really reinforced to me, like, wow, this is like, this is crazy. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting because it is, it's a funny thing too that you actually recognized it and did something about it. A lot of guys see this, maybe recognize it, but choose to go, nah, it's not going to happen to me. <laughs> and ultimately, it does. Um, and before look, before we go down that road, because there's a lot more stuff I want to talk to you about that, um, I want to give a little bit of background on you leading up to that point. And it wasn't like, and this is my opinion of it too, is that it wasn't like you were a clacked out rider and you know everyone was looking at him, when's this guy going to hang it up? I think you threw the curveball to the peloton. You, got, you, you had a tour de, France, tour de France selection, which we all know is a hard thing to do. Then all of a sudden, with still a year left on your contract at Green Edge, you decided to call it quits then. In the midst of, I think you're only 31 years old, middle of your, your prime, still with a lot to come. You've just got the selection of the Tour de France. Who knows what it was going to bring in the next few years. From the outside, people might have viewed that as, Wow, Christian's in the prime. But in your mind, this is the way I saw it, you had some things on the back burner. You were like, you know what? I don't want to get to the end of my career and just be, be known just for, as a cyclist. I want to have another part of my life too. Like you said, mm-hmm. cycling is a small part of our life and I want something else in my life. Is that, is that sort of how it was going? Exactly. I think there's a couple things there for me personally was always the reason – Firstly, that I started bike racing mm-hmm. was because I loved bike riding. And when I was a young guy, when I was 17 or 16, I'd started riding and I just, I absolutely fell in love with bike riding. You know, it became my everything. It became my independence. I could explore. I could go places I couldn't drive, but it was like, it was, I could see the world. And I just fell in love with everything that was about the adventure of riding going fast and going far. I mean, this is what really I loved so much about riding. To the point where I was like, how can I ride my bike every day? And I thought, I'm going to become a professional bike rider. (laughs) Simple as that. Simple as that. So I told my parents, look, I'm going to become a professional bike rider. Um, And I was fortunate because my parents said, great, go for it. (laughs) You know, like they never said, Uh, I don't know, like, is that really a good career? Like, can you really do that? Like, there was never any question. It was just, you know what? Go for it. Um, The only thing is, if you're going to go for it, you go for it 100% and you try. Like, you give everything to try to make it work. And if it doesn't work, then you've tried and you can come home and you can work on the farm or do whatever you want. Um, So to me, that already was, okay, I'm going to be a bike rider. And then the racing was just what enabled me to ride. And so it wasn't the racing that was the end goal for me. It wasn't that, you know, I, I want to be a bike racer as long as I can, as long as I can keep riding my bike, mm. you know, which I still do, which is still all I want to do. That, that's kind of was the important factor there. Um, and then secondly, you know, we spend a lot of time as professionals, like you were saying. I mean, the Tour de France is our pinnacle, right? Yeah. Um, and we work a really long time to try to make that Tour de France team. And the t- type of rider I was, you know, I was a domestique. Um, 
it was always going to be hard to make the tour. Um, like I would really have to be at my ultimate best um, just to be on the long list. There would have to be the makeup of the team would have to suit my sort of style of, of, of being able to help. So it was always going to be a stretch for me to do yeah. it. And, but regardless, both my wife and I spent a really long time working really hard to do that. And then after I did that, you know, I wasn't naive in the fact that, okay, that the first time I've done it, okay, now I'm set. I'm going to be on the tour team for the next five years. It could happen the same thing the next year. Exactly. Just can I pause you there because I think it's really interesting of explain to everyone a little bit about your tour selection. Yeah, it's a really funny, really funny situation because, um, you know, I was on the long list from the beginning of, of the year and... This is 2015? 14. 14. Yeah. And it was actually quite funny because the whole year and, and um, like, I don't know if, if, if you even know this about it. I probably don't, yeah. But the, that whole s- sort of preseason, I always sort of said to myself and to Quadi, our, our, yeah. my coach on the team and the team's head coach, I was said I'm going to the tour. And I was told them, mate, whenever there's a question about training, like, uh, I was just like, whatever's best for the tour, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of like, obviously jokingly, yeah. but I always kind of was telling my mate. I'm going to be there. We need to prep for the tour, right? And it's prepping for the tour, everything, everything. Um, <laughs> like, you know, generally the real tour riders are yeah. always saying, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we just got everything's prepping for the tour. So I just the Garens of the world, the exactly, Armstrongs of the exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. So I said, like, quad, you know, whatever, we're just prepping for the tour. And so, you know, we've done recon, we've done everything. So I was on the long list. Anyway, um, I didn't get selected. When did you find that out? Week before? I found that out at the Dauphiné, end okay. of the Dauphiné. So, so two weeks two before. Two weeks before, yeah. yeah. And, but the team said, look, uh, you're not on the squad, but you're the first reserve. So if something happens, you know, you're, you're still in with a shot, so you still need to be ready. In the meanwhile, I went back to Canada, did our national championships. So now we're at the week before, um, even a little bit less. And because I was already in Canada and it was in, in starting in Europe, obviously, I said, okay, whatever, now we're a week out. I'm not going to no, go. no one's really going to get sick now. It's kind of like, you know. So my wife and I went on holiday to Las Vegas. <laughs> As you do, right? <laughs> Had the bike crunching yeah, K's Exactly, out exactly. So I was thinking heat in the desert, you know, it'd be great training. <laughs> yeah, right. No, so we were in Vegas, um, you know, just having a good time, enjoying Vegas for, for what it is. And on the second day I'm there, you know, I wake up in the morning and I have like a message sort of from the team and from from Whitey, our sports yeah. director. Um, so the first I read the team email and it was a very unfortunate email because it was the year that, you know, um, Daryl had come back for a contaminated substance. That's right. Um, and so Daryl wasn't doing the tour. And it's Daryl Wimpy, yeah. Yeah. And he talks about that on his previous podcast. Really interesting. Yeah. And, but the team said, we're taking Simon Yates to the tour, which to me was, you know what? That makes sense. You know, it starts in the UK. Um, the team is entertaining. At the time, was entertaining a, a British sponsor, potentially. And he's already there. Like, he was at the start, basically. Yeah. He had to drive an hour in the car to get there, and I was in bloody Vegas. And so, anyway, I rang Whitey, and then we had a conversation, and Whitey, like, talked me to, through the whole thing, you know. So, why did you get this email if I was just telling you about Yatesy? But this was this was the general team email. Ah, right? okay. So that everyone to everyone got, on the long list. No, to, to the whole team oh, about Daryl. Yeah, I probably got the yeah, same email. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Just explain the situation with Daryl, yeah, what's yeah, going okay. on, and yeah. what's going to happen. Um, and I was talking to Whitey. We were kind of discussing everything, and we we're talking a, a good half an hour. This and, is Matt White, yeah, the team exactly. director. So yeah. we're talking about everything and how they're going to take Simon and why and this. And I mean, I was completely okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I in like, Vegas. I'm, I'm cool, yeah, dude. That's take fine. Who you I mean, want. I understand why and yeah. everything. And then like just before he's about to hang up the phone, he's like, uh, oh, yeah, and by the way, 
Michael Matthews just crashed out training. <laughs> <laughs> his last training ride, he's taking the flight this afternoon to the start, and he was just doing an easy spin, and he binned it on the spin, and we don't know how bad it is yet, but he might still have to come. No. So I'm like, you know, trying to kind of prep myself and why he's like, okay, I'll know a bit more in a few hours and I'll call you back and all that sort of stuff. Have but, a good day. Yeah. So here I am in, 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 in Vegas, right? And it's, it's quite funny because, you know, I hadn't ridden my bike in five days and, you know, I was enjoying life and having a good time in Vegas and like eating and, you know, just like whatever. Had a margarita and, in exactly, hand. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, like any bike rider, I'm kind of like, shit, I should probably do some riding. <laughs> Did you actually have your bike there? No, but <laughs> I went down to the gym, right? <laughs> basically in civvies because I didn't like bring gym stuff, right? So I'm down there in, in jeans and a shirt yeah, and a shirt. And I'm just like, get on this spin bike. And I'm just like, just <laughs> getting the legs turning a bit, right? I didn't know yeah, about this. Yeah. And the guy like, there's a guy like next to me and I'm like, like pedaling pretty hard. I'm like the guy next to me. He's like, looks over at me. He's like, Hey man, it's not the Tour de France. And I'm like, <laughs> cool, buddy. you're right, buddy. It's not, but who knows? Um, oh shit. Anyway, then, so why do you rang me back a bit later? He's like, um, you know, we're still waiting for Matthews to get to the start to have the team doctor take a look at him. Um, but, you know, you can come to the start. There's about 50-50 chance that you'll start. Um, we don't know yet because we don't know his situation. And because of the time change and everything, you know, he's got to get here. We have to have Manuel, our team doctor, take a look at him and all this. And I said, you know what, I'll come anyway. I said, just book the ticket round trip. And if I don't start, I'll just fly back to Canada the next day. Right? Yeah. So what, just one day out or something like that, you'd lose two exactly. days. Exactly, yeah. you know, whatever. I was going to have a, a break anyway, so yeah. it was, you know, take a couple of days of my vacation. It's no big deal. So anyway, I just, Vegas, Vancouver, a friend met me with all my luggage at the airport, and then I flew over straight to the, to the UK to start landing in Manchester. And then I uh, got picked up in Manchester, had to go straight to, the univer- like, to a university to get my blood test done. Oh, yeah. Because I missed the the actual pre-tour Blood medicals test, yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, then when I got there, it was quite evident that Michael was not in a very good state. You know, he had had some injury on his hand and everything. Um, so there we go. Started the Tour de France. Having not ridden my bike in like five, six days, arrived basically a day and a half before the start. <laughs> so I, the day before, I got to do a little spin, ride my bike. And, and then, then start, you're in. And then I'm in. The funny thing is, like, accreditation had no photo on it because I didn't get to do, you know, the photo. I didn't get to do a team presentation. I didn't get to do any of that stuff. Um, but it was great. I mean, it was incredible because realistically, it was, the, you know, the best grand tour I'd had yeah. ever. I felt amazing the whole time. I know I was fresh. Do you think I, that helped? That's what I was about to ask you. Do you think it really helped, like the, the mental side of it and the physical actual rest? Man, I think so many times about how much I think we're slightly fatigued yeah, all the time. That's what I was about right? to say. Like I was so fresh and, and mentally fresh. Okay, the first day my heart rate was a bit higher, but, you know, that's normal anyway. And But from then on, I was just good the whole tour, mm. you know, and also I wasn't stressing about – the stages, I mean, I didn't. I hadn't looked at the book. I hadn't looked at anything. I mean, I didn't know what was happening. We'd reconned uh, two stages that we were that we were targeting with, with Simon. And that's all I knew about the race. And uh, it was fantastic, you know. And, and then finishing on the Champs-Élysées and the whole family came over and everything. It was, it, was, it was a super cool experience. And, you know, I was super fortunate to do it. Um, but I also recognized, okay, this was kind of for us, every, everything mm. aligned yeah. to do it, you know. Um, and unfortunately, that year, Garo crashed in the first stage, mm. which was a big That's kind right. of hit to the team. That. Yeah, when Cavendish sort of yeah. clipped his wheel and, and uh, took him out. So that was really unfortunate for the team, but... Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a super cool experience. I'm happy you told that story. I actually forgot that it was so good. I didn't know half of that. But um, let's go back to what we were yeah. talking about. And the point was 2.14, the tour. Mm. And 
Yeah, you you were saying that you know it becomes this pinnacle thing that you got to do in your career, and you were just at that point, you know, doing it for the love of cycling, cycling itself, and not the racing. And I guess at that point when you had the tour and you said you'd worked so hard to do it with your wife and as you hear from that story, everything aligned for it, was it then that you started to think like at what moment after the tour there had you started to come to that point where I'm actually not in it just for the racing when did that realization again come back to you that, hang on, I really just love it for cycling in as it is, the racing as well, but also just riding. And I want to do this still for the rest of my life, but I still have other passions. At what point did that start creeping in? Because I think like we've pointed out a couple of times now, you're at that pinnacle part of your career. You started achieving the big goals, 31 years old. I remember you were racing together. You were mm-hmm. strong as an ox, going to world championships, you know, there was nothing physically wrong with you to end your career. So run me through that next sort of couple of years. Because I think what happened after that was sort of when we did the tour. I say we because my wife and I, we, every, like you know, I mean, it's, you're only as good as your supporters. Um, I remember going, we went to the beach um, some, some days after. And we both kind of hit this sort of what's next moment. You know, we've achieved basically what we, what we set out to achieve. I mean, I'd done all the races that I wanted to do. We did the tour. We did all the grand tours. We did, you know, um, all the classics, bar the art, the cobble classics, because it was never my thing. We did, did everything, right? And we started to realize for my wife, she was sort of like, okay, now I need to do something else. You know, I need something for myself. She's a very ambitious person and she loves to work and she loves to do things. And in this, in parallel, those sort of previous couple of years, I've been developing a, a stronger passion for coffee. I mean, mm. it developed when I was racing younger, but in those sort of couple of years uh, previous in Europe, it really sort of accelerated, you know, my, you know, sort of passion becoming slight obsession with, with coffee. <laughs> and so you sort of parallel interests were developing at mm-hmm. the same time as, as I was still racing. And my wife's background had been in, in cafes and she oh. studied hospitality, she studied tourism, she studied all these sorts of things. Uh, and she was a people person, that's what she loved to do. So we always had this idea of, of doing a cafe. We didn't know where, if it was going to be Canada or, or anything. But at that point in our lives, we sort of decided that we probably were not going to go back to Canada, that we were going to stay in, in Europe. And, you know, just there on that beach, we were talking about a lot of things. And, you know, in the beginning it was sort of like, well, maybe, maybe I'll go back to Canada for a few months at a time, work there, and we can kind of like go back and forth and different things. And then we finally ended up at, well, why don't we just open the cafe here? Mm. I mean, Girona had zero specialty coffee, didn't exist. Um, we had no idea how we were going to do it. Or if it would work, if it would work, or I mean, we didn't speak Catalan, and we just sort of said, "Well, why not?" Though I mean, <laughs> you just have to, you just have to start, you just have to try, you know. And and at the end of the day, the more that you spend time over the years, sort of becoming an entrepreneur, you realize it's mostly just about solving problems, mm. right? So you just have to start, and when you hit a roadblock, you know, figure out the solution. And then you just keep going. Yeah. So we're like, you know what? Let's just go for it. We've got nothing to lose. Um, and if we can just get the door open, that'll already be, you know, Success. incredible. You and know? we'll deal with the problems as they come along. Exactly. But then at that point there, I guess you probably were just re-signing for another two years on. At that point there, we think, well, you know what? We'll take it on as a pro cyclist. Was there no idea of okay, I'm setting this up for after my career or I'm going to slowly move into this. Was this just sort of like, like you said, Amber was looking for something else. You're like, great, I'm going to help you along the way as much as I can, but this will be majority your project? Yeah, it was sort of like that. Um, initially, it was uh, more for Amber to be able to really get stuck into something and, and pour herself into. And I was going to help, um, especially on the coffee side, right, and the cafe side, would be her thing to sort of manage and the coffee side would be more my thing to manage 
Um, but then what started to develop is that, you know, at this time I, I was still racing, but, you know, when we opened, I would, it was Amber and one part-time employee. So I would go training and I'd come back and I'd work, you know, or I'd work in the morning and then I'd go training. And just because I, I also loved that aspect of the coffee so much, right? And it wasn't a hassle. It was actually no, a joy. No, it like, was enjoyable. Oh, I'm I mean, so good to go bloody training. Yeah. And then, but it also was never like I need to go training, yeah. you know, and it was never like I need to work in the cafe. I mean, they're just two things that I enjoyed equally. Yeah. But the greatest thing about it was that it took away the almost like the training in the training. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because as athletes and, you know, people that are sort of obsessed with performance, you generally overanalyze all the situations around you. You know, you're out there, you're riding, oh, is my saddle like a mill too high? I don't know, I'm a bit tired today. I don't know how am I feeling. Like you're questioning so many things all the time. Got too much time to question it. And for the first time for me, it was like, I go biking, to, yeah. go biking. This is what they've written down. Just crank out the numbers, get home, and do something else. And it was that switch of when I'm riding, I'm riding, and when I'm not, I'm doing something else. And for the first time, my mind wasn't just thinking about everything to do with bike racing, yeah, you know. Nice. And that just allowed me actually to be better at bike racing. Yeah, it really. And it was funny because there was, you know, there are always people that, you know, want to talk about stuff. And there's guys saying, ah, oh, you know, it's going to be, it's all downhill for here, for him. And it's going to be terrible. He's spending all his time doing the coffee stuff and blah, blah, blah. That first year of La Fabrica was the best year of my career. Yeah. Like the best that I felt, you know, the strongest I'd ever been. And it was just for that reason. You know, like I didn't question anything. I didn't question can I do this effort? You know, am I feeling strong enough today? I didn't think about any of that stuff. And when I went racing, I was like out there just giving her and then get back and I'll think, be thinking about, you know, what's the next coffee we're going to buy for the shop or, you know, are we going to get into roasting or, or different things? Like just, and it was just the mind. It wasn't mm. physical exertion. You know, it was just thinking about different things for once just allowed me to be freer when it came to racing, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. Like you take you're taking the psychological aspect out of it and it's not you're not downplaying what you're doing at all with the racing. You just want you simplified it to what mm. actually it is. And exactly what you say, we and I'm hundred percent guilty of this, mm. over analyzing it. We're cla- we're we're chronic over analyzing. Yeah. You know, it's and it's in everything you do and eventually over time it's funny because you, you tend to also bring those, that trait into other things in your life. Like also, it took me quite a long time eventually to sort of be able to just back it off a notch mm-hmm. because I would also do that in my businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, like you get to a point where like, okay, you need to be very stringent and have high standards but you also need to have a point where, okay, let's just back it off a notch. You yeah. know, or, there, or you just end up being crazy all the time because there's so much stuff to do. And if you overanalyze every single situation, you're just going to make yourself crazy. You can't control you everything. You can't control everything. So a bit about learning that. But uh, yeah, so then I kind of kept racing for those initial couple of years because I still really loved racing. Um, but in parallel, what was happening was – you know, all this business side and the coffee side and the interest for coffee was just sort of growing. And I was a very, at a very initial part of that growth process. And what was happening in bike racing was I felt like I'd gotten to a point, I'd done the tour, I'd sort of established my role the best as it would be. I'd sort of achieved a, a certain salary that probably wouldn't increase much more and i got to a point i said you know what what were you earning then a million million and a half 2.1 <laughs> <laughs> over 15 years yeah, yeah. Exactly. um but i sort of got to this point where i was like you know what i can just hit cruise control and i can just do the next five years here same training camp 
same races every year it was kind of like going to be groundhog day and just coasting yeah. through and some people are okay with that yeah. like some people don't mind that like some people even people when you start to have a lot of people working for you you generally see the personalities of people and some people enjoy that routine and sort of you might call it monotony and just like well, every day safe, doing it? the same thing uh, and for me i felt okay like this is kind of stale and if i'm not growing anymore as a person it's time to move on to something that's pushing you personally on a growth level. And as that sort of coffee and business was just at its initial sort of growth, I just kind of thought, well, I've got a lot to learn here. And by doing sort of five years of coasting, I'm actually just wasting a lot of time Mm. when I could be really pouring myself into something that's sort of taking off rather than, than, than stealing. So eventually I reached the point where um, you know, and we were riding together in, the, in those last years and, you know, we were speaking about it, yeah. um, early on to you. And I was sort of saying, you know, I'm thinking about probably stopping and, and my reasons for that. And, you know, it was not a decision that I just overnight was like, okay, I'm out. It was something that we, we thought about also. And, and, and my wife was great. She said, like, look, if you're going to stop, I mean, are you really ready to stop? Because this is not something that you want to stop. And then six re- months down the track, you're like, Oh, I wish I was yeah, back there. Exactly. Yeah. And regret it. Um, because it is quite a great life. I yeah. mean, it, it gave us a lot of what we have. I mean, we lived in Europe. Uh, we had time. We could do all these sorts of incredible things and met a lot of incredible people through riding bikes. Um, but then I realized, okay, no, I think I'm done. You know, and how, how did sorry? How did you know that though, or you just didn't know? No, I knew. You just you just you felt it. You Garden felt stick. it. Yeah. I mean, when you sort of feel like going to a bike race is work, and that you would rather be at home, mm. I was like, okay, that's it. You know, yep. it's when bike racing is sacrifice through mm. and through, and when that balance tips of like the sacrifice is easy. Mm to okay now the sacrifice is getting much harder Mm. then i just knew okay this is you know it's not is there a moment now where you're looking at it going oh i wouldn't mind being there or i could i could definitely still do that no no don't miss bike racing single day Mm. not at all um but that's also because i still ride my bike a lot Mm. So I still get to ride my bike. It comes the, back to your initial passion. Exactly. Like you said, I was never in it for racing, yeah. even though you did find racing and that was a way to keep doing your initial yeah. passion. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is in 2011, I'd ridden with Charlie Wigelius. Yep. Uh, and we did a year together in United Healthcare. And that was his last year, right? And I remember Charlie and I were going really well on that team and doing all the races together and rooming together. And I remember him... When he told me, he's like, mate, I think I'm thinking about stopping, thinking about stopping bike racing. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I remember that point. I just, I didn't get it. Mm. I was like, come on, man. You can't be like, this is awesome. You know, we're racing bikes. We're here. This is such a great time. You know, racing is the best thing ever. And I just couldn't grasp that he was thinking about, no, I'm done. I've just, I've had enough. You know, he was still riding really strong. He was. And then I remember when I got to that point and Charlie had moved on to being a director for... for My team, EF exactly, Education exactly. First. Yeah. And I remember seeing him at a race that year that I was thinking about stopping. And I remember seeing him. I, I went and I chatted with him like, I now know where you were. Like when you were th- sitting there and having those thoughts and, that, and you, you knew it was enough. I, I feel now, I couldn't at the time comprehend at all where you were, but now I'm like, now I know exactly what you were feeling. And that also to me was like a reformation that like, okay, it's yeah. time, time, time to go. So then that year, um, because like you said, I still had a year left on my contract. I had a, a sit down with, with um, Shane Bannon, the general manager of the team and at the Dauphiné, and just said... I made like I'm I'm thinking about stopping, you know. I'm thinking about uh, you know I've I've got these things that I would like to do in my life um, that have been going on in parallel, and and honestly, I just don't want to waste your time. Yeah. I mean, cycling is one of these sports where 
especially in, in the last few years as the, the racing has gotten so intense um, that if you're not in it 100%, man, you may as well not start. It's just too hard. It's, it's too, too hard. hard. You just suffer way too much. Yep. It's not even worth it. And I didn't want to be that guy who just shows up you know, half-heartedly and it's just wasting a spot on a team you know because generally what happens is that okay you can say all oh, my knees sore or you just show up not fit and then eventually if you're not fit enough the team just stops racing and you sit on the sidelines and you know but, but who wants to feel like that and the thing is you've got guys and if you're just anyone genuine you would feel bad for that plus you've also got teammates that you are mates with and you feel like you're letting them down even yeah. when you are trying and you can't do your job, let alone when you're not trying and you don't do your job. I would just feel like a piece of dirt. And then you've got, you know, a whole host of young guys totally. who are just chomping at the bit to have an opportunity to race on a pro team and you're just here less like, oh, well, I'm just going to cash Collect out my, my check wage, for yeah. the last year and then bugger off, you know. Mm. When reality, maybe if you took that year and really dedicated yourself to what you're doing in in your other passion uh, passions and and businesses you know you may end up better off in that paycheck mm. right so it's just a matter of, of where you're going to focus your your efforts so you know and and Shane was you know very on board and understood really well about you know what I was what I was trying to do um, and I and I think that the team was was appreciative that I decided to stop instead of kind just of cashing just in, cashing yeah. in one more year to for for nothing and um, yeah, that was it. So, well, let's talk about your businesses now, more specifically, because, like you said before, you started up with in Girona with La Fabrica as the cafe, and then you, as I remember talking to you, and you can explain this a bit better. La Fabrica was a cafe with a small focus on coffee, but you're like, you know what? This is not going to do me. I need a specialty coffee store. So you, once La Fabrica got up and running, you start up this great little spot called Espresso Mafia, which is, which I see as a very Melbourne type little specialty coffee hole in the wall, with a roastery right there. You started roasting as well, and then the third thing you did, which I think is really neat, is you start up another business called the Service Course, which is a quite a neat fit with life in the Peloton because it is, and you can explain this too. It's it's the experience for people who never get to go in the peloton to experience what we experience as professionals who are doing cyclotourism here in Girona. So exactly. Explain, yeah, explain those three little ideas that you had there and how they fit. Exactly. So La Fabrica basically in the beginning was um, a couple of things. There was no specialty coffee in Girona. There was a, at the time, the cyclotourism industry hadn't really boomed yet. But we had a massive group of professional cyclists living here and nowhere to get a decent cup of coffee. And so we decided, okay, perfect, we'll, we'll do that. We sort of thought, okay, at least in the first months, we'll just have the pros coming who are looking for a coffee. coffee you yeah. know? And so that started and then it was going well. It was starting, it was picking up, it was going good. Then we did get shut down actually after a couple of months which was a whole fiasco, which is one of our big things. We got shut for like six weeks, had to do all the stuff, and then finally opened again. Um, and There's then, a whole podcast on b- b- building a business in Spain too. Yeah. <laughs> coming next. <laughs> yeah, coming next. Um, and then Mafia sort of came for a couple of reasons. One was I never wanted to have a, in the beginning, I didn't want to have a cycling cafe yep. because – I didn't want people to come to my cafe just because it was cycling themed and it was owned by a professional rider. I wanted people to come to a cafe because they had the best coffee. Hmm. And but we decided on the cycling cafe. I'm actually, sort of a mate of mine from from Canada sort of said, "Look, you should really do it. You mean you should take advantage. You know, cycling is who you are, and I understand this moment you want to kind of have that differentiation." But it is who you are, and it forms a big part of, of your life. And so we decided, okay, we'll we'll do we'll do the fabric cycling themed. And then espresso mafia came for two reasons. One, I really wanted to start to control the roasting process because at that time, you have to understand that time, especially coffee in Spain almost didn't exist. Yeah, like Barcelona had a takeaway place and a card shop, 
and that was about it. And there was another guy roasting. And so it was almost non-existent. So getting coffee actually was not so easy. So in the beginning, what we were doing is I was buying my own coffee and having it roasted by someone, which then eventually led to me thinking, okay, I would like to control that process. So we opened Espresso Mafia uh, for two reasons. Firstly, to roast the coffee ourselves. Um, so I taught myself to roast at home in the beginning. I was yeah. already roasting at home. He had a little <laughs> roastery in the house. And I even yeah. visited that roastery. The initial roastery was it was brilliant. It was a mini roaster. I don't know how much did it roast at the time? Five hundred grams. Five hundred grams. Some of the some of the good original beans oh, were doing yeah. some tasters, weren't oh, we? Yeah, that was great. That was great. Like yeah. little bags and a little you know roasting day and roast little like five, five bags in like three hours. It was <laughs> terrible, um, but learned a lot. And then so we did mafia little roaster in there. And on the other side, a coffee shop. Less sort of food brunchy and more just coffee and some small cakes. In a style of a cafe that I originally thought was more like this is a cafe. You mm-hmm. know, and not cycling, not anything, just a nice cafe. Um, so then that sort of grew and more roasting and then all that sort of coffee stuff kept, kept going. And then we decided one time... Um, I had working at La Fabrica and being there a lot, we started to have, you know, the cyclotourism thing was starting to kind of kick, in, kick into play. And I started to see all these customers coming in, these sort of people that had come from, you know, Australia or the U.S. or wherever to ride bikes. And every time they came to the shop, to La Fabrica, I would ask them, I would talk to them, and like, you know, why did you come to Girona? What are you doing here? You know, how did you find Girona? All these sorts of things. And... I eventually realized there was a sort of consistency in their answers. And one thing that always sort of kept coming up was that they thought there wasn't really anywhere that was serving the needs that they were looking for. You know, the the North American and the Australasian sort of client is much different than the European one. Mm. You know, they've got much less time when it comes to vacation. They have much less vacation days. It's much further to get here. Yeah. So they want to come and they want to have a week and they want to have an epic experience, you know. Um, and there was nowhere really doing that at the time. So I started thinking a lot cycling about... Cycling related. Exactly, yeah. cycling related. So we thought, hey, look, this could be pretty neat. Um, we both love the hospitality aspect of the business and being with people and, and hosting people and things like that. So we sort of jumped on it and, and the whole idea about it uh, right from the name to the sort of experience was, you know, we as professionals, not that we take for granted, but, you know, that experience that we have on a daily basis, which is, you know, get up in the morning, have your breakfast, get to the race, bike is ready, race ready, you go on your race, you come back, you have your space, you like fling your bike to the mechanic, you know, you go on the bus, you have a shower, you have some food on the bus. You get back, throw the laundry out in front of the door. Yeah. And you've got all these things that make your performance as easy as possible. Like the team takes away all the little niggles that, you know, just allow you to focus on recovery and performance. Everything is ready. You don't have to think about a thing. So our idea is, well, we can use that same philosophy but apply it to a cycling holiday, right? So the idea being that if you come on a cycling holiday, you know, do you want to be carrying your bike up the little out, up the little stairways in the bloody apartment buildings? You know, Have it in your room with a chain going on the wall. And, and finding a place to do your laundry and, you know, all these sorts of just things that make it annoying that would take up an extra two hours of your day if you had to do this every day. Because at the end of the day, you're here on a holiday, right? You want to ride your bike, but the number one th- reason you came is because you're on vacation, mm. right? So just the premise was that you come to the service course, you can leave your bike, um, you can walk in in the morning, take your bike, get changed there. There's lockers, there's showers, there's everything, there's mechanics, we massage, we do laundry. So the idea is you walk in the door, take your bike, go riding, Tell me, wait, tell me about the showers too because they're really cool. Yeah, so the showers, we, we model them after the Paris-Roubaix showers Yeah. Um, with the little chains and everything. And it even takes a little while for the water to get hot so you kind of get, get the full experience there. <laughs> that was purposely done. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We made it that 
that tube extra long. Um, That's a cool. But we still idea. need to put yeah. the plaques. So I'm, I'm still trying to find a way to get the plaques on. The, you can put on one there, like Mitch Tucker, like, and then just put in small writing future winner. Yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so then we kind of decided, you know, come get changed or whatever, come back, drop the bike, take a shower. Basically, when you walked out at the end of your ride, if you when you walked out of the shop, you like just walked into your holiday. Yeah. I mean, just go straight to lunch, meet mm. family, do whatever, go and experience your own, experience culture, experience your holiday, right? And then the other aspect was of it was, you know what, we want to kind of do something different and cool. And for me, that was, if you go on a holiday, generally, what do you like to do? You like to stay in a nicer place, eat at a nicer restaurant. You know, it's kind of about really enjoying everything mm. about it. So why not ride a nicer bike, you know? And why not have the opportunity to experience something you've never had? Like maybe you've not ridden electronic shifting or not ridden disc brake or you've not ridden a set of Envy wheels or you've not. So what we really try to do is have this sort of really next level experience. Yeah, experience yeah right? and you come back and you're like, same as exactly what you said. You, you, go, you go stay in this, this five-star hotel that's got a – it's got a jacuzzi in the room and yeah. you're not having that stuff at home. No. Exactly. Same as like on the bike. You're not going to have that. Well, maybe you don't have that at home. So you want to experience the top end. Or if you have it at home, you don't want to go on a holiday and downgrade. No. Right. So it's sort of what's the best that we can offer is kind of what we try to mm. try to do. So, yeah, that was uh, we've been going on that now for a couple of years. And, uh, Tell me about your mentality. This is something that I was thinking about. I've spoken to someone about this. I was talking to them about, oh, you know, whatever I do after my career, don't know about this, don't know about that. And he said to me, look, I think with you and professional sportsmen in general is you guys have such a a self-motivation when it comes to work. And I, and I mean like our training. No one's out there whipping us with a, a whip if we go and do that effort that you said or go up that climb hard or even just get out on the bike. It's up to us. And ultimately, it's up to us to become professional, stay professional, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to go in and punch the ticket in every morning. So I think my theory is that when it comes to, and I get this feeling too, when it comes to another passion that I want to do, I have that self-motivation that I want to do. Is that something that sort of helps you get these three businesses up and going? And when you run into those speed bumps, problem solving or whatever, do you, do you see that similarity between pro cycling and that? It's funny, mate, because when I started kind of getting into that real world, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. If you have any work ethic, you're already like two steps ahead. <laughs> and the reason that some of these, you know, another reason that maybe we switched switch the roasting was you actually realize people out there, you know, your coffee might not arrive because the guy's like, oh, I didn't get to it today. Yeah. And you're like, what do you mean you didn't get to it today? Like, you kind of do it. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's a job that you had to just do. So that means you had to work a few extra hours. You would just go and do it. No. Yeah. But reality is no. People, People don't, you know. It's, and you sort of start to think, holy cow. I mean, we've got, you know, the luxury that you, like you say, of, of being a professional athlete is that you work so hard, I think especially in something like cycling because it's a real – endurance event right so you actually have to work a lot and you spend a lot of time sort of riding and riding and riding and recovering and, and suffering um when you apply that work ethic to the real world um and you also start to realize that sometimes you think you know what when you start to do businesses and you've got you know, competition coming or you've got certain things like that, which is natural in, in the world because it always happens. But one thing that sometimes you can reassure yourself is I can guarantee you or you can guarantee to yourself that those other people are not willing to work as hard as I am. Mm. Like, I think one thing that you sort of think is that you coming from that background are willing to dig so deep, mm. right? And push yourself so far 
and you know that your tolerance to push yourself is so much farther than a normal person could potentially handle that you're like i got this covered don't worry about it yeah you know like if if they want to like really and that's the thing with competition they push you but you always realize nah i keep pushing but you know you don't know what fire you just started if this is the long game (laughs) yeah i'm willing to to keep going you know so it's exactly what you said i mean you just you have that work ethic and that drive and that self-motivation that just keeps you going, you know? Tell me about this next phase. Um, and I, th- I find this exciting. You just broke this to me just a few minutes ago when we were chatting before the podcast. I didn't know about it, but what we're just talking about, the service course, and I said, well, what's next? And you said, well, you know, there's a couple of couple of more serv- service courses coming. Mm-hmm. It's expanding. That's the next phase. And what the, the amazing thing about it, which I thought was cool, is that it's not only expanding with yourself, but it's expanding with some other pros now. And this is making that sort of that bridge that you were talking about that you did on your own. You're opening it up now for some guys who are in the Peloton. You're creating that bridge for them now as well with the service course. Explain a little bit about what's happening there. Yeah, so uh, last year we decided to to sort of expand the service course um, with a with a friend of mine that I met some years ago, who's uh, sort of from the corporate world, but a very keen keen cyclist. And um, you know, we thought, well, let, let's have a crack at let's see what we can do with the service course. Um, because the thing for us generally that tends to happen, and I don't know why, but maybe this is sort of the same thing that happened when. Whenever things start to get sort of um, a bit too calm, style, yeah. we get anxious <laughs> and we start doing something. Um, so we thought, okay, let, let's have a crack at, at what, what can we do with the service course? I mean, we don't know. We have the one in Girona. Um, some people think it's, it's a great concept and it could be applied at other places in the world. And... For us, initially, to do that on our own would have been a very, very big ask, right? Because uh, neither my wife or I studied business. So when it starts to get into a proper company and we need to start having satellite locations and different things like that and setting up a corporate structure and, and all these sorts of things, you know, we need we need help. Um, so my partner, Adam, came on board and, and we decided to, to have a go. So we sort of locked out of initially a couple key locations that we thought could be good but it's interesting thing is in those locations what we did have is we had people first Mm. right so we had uh florence was the first place that we decided okay this could be a a good spot for us because a couple of years before i met two guys um, from florence who were really great guys who really had the passion and the work ethic that Mm. but and the understanding of the concept that would be like, okay, these guys are, are fit for what we're doing, right? And they could run our operations there. Um, and as we started going there, uh, you know, other opportunities started to come. And we ended up having an opportunity in, in Oslo, mm. in Norway, with uh, Henrik Ora, um, who was the chef at Team Sky for many years. Yep. And has his Velo Chef books and, and that. And, uh, and a local guy named Jonas on a Stromberg and you know it was always about the people like how can we get the right people in the right locations that really kind of determine first if it's an option or not totally. and, then we, and then we start to say okay well what are the how is that area for riding how is the area for you know certain aspects of, of the business and then okay we've, we've keyed locations we potentially have one more location and then it's okay now we need to start getting some money if we're gonna if we're gonna build this up and like I mentioned to you earlier I, I wasn't necessarily very interested in in just getting you know some VC to fund our our business and you know take a big cut and not really understand or care about what we were really doing yep just seeing um, it for the investment yeah exactly yeah. so my my idea was why don't we go with the pros you know for two reasons. Professional cyclists, yeah, that is. Yeah. Exactly. For two reasons. One, that's where I came from. Yeah. And these are these are my people. These are the people that I know and are like my mates and, and people that, 
you know, I converse with and, and see on a daily basis in, in Girona or wherever or I've been teammates with for a long time. And also to have them have the opportunity to start to do something outside of their professional career. Mm. Um, and start to think about the future and, and and maybe experience what you were talking about in the very beginning with La Fabrica, that whole I've got something else to occupy my mind. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. So we approached a few people that um, had already expressed interest in in sort of being a part of, of the service course in the future. Like when, when an opportunity sort of arose, they said let us know and we can do it. Um, so we've got a few, a few pros, current pros and, and former. So a teammate, former teammate of, of ours, Simon yep. Garens. Cool. Um, who's now, I mean, talk about post-career. Yeah, change. Know, went straight to Goldman Sachs in <laughs> London. <laughs> it's like, it's a pretty heavy, heavy change. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't mind having quite an intensive work life, but uh, Garo's kind of next level on that front. Um, and then current pros, so Mike Woods, who's yep. a teammate of yours now, and he's a guy that always sort of I'd known since the beginning, and, and he's just such a great guy. And he'd always sort of express and just like, look, if, if you're ever doing something in Canada, I'd love to be a part of it, or you know. So, and then uh, we also have Edvold, Bosenhagen, yeah, from yeah. Uh, you know he sort of came with um, he is also knowing Edvold through riding. And also Edvold being the ultimate coffee geek times 10. Uh, <laughs> he's such a nerd. Um, we used to speak a lot about coffee when we were, when we were riding in, in races. And uh, he is also quite good friends with, with um, Henrik and Jonas in, in Oslo. Cool. Um, so they're quite a good little group there. And also we brought on Cassia Noida Doma because for us it was really important to... To incorporate the women's side of, of cycling also. And she's from Poland, isn't she? She's from Poland and she's a very great person because she's so enthusiastic about getting more women riding bikes. Um, and it's a very important part of, of you know cycling in general now. I mean, to get more female riding bike and have them being comfortable in, in, in our environment and you know to also support that women's racing side of cycling, right? To sort of be able to to uh, showcase mm. what they're doing, um, and also in the future some initiatives that we're going to have with inside the the service course as we grow, um, to sort of really highlight that much more. So is it is it a purely well, now we've named their names, so they're not like a hidden sort of investor. How much involvement do these guys want to be, or is that, is that their choice, or what's your idea around that? What's, what was your whole idea when they approached you or when you approached them? I mean, our whole idea was two things. You can do as much or as little as you like. I mean, most are very enthusiastic about being a part of it and about being a part of of sort of because to me it's important a couple of reasons is I think it's important that people start to a kind of build their brands beyond their race team, right? Because I think mm. one thing that cycling does, um, when you look at professional cycling in general, I think it, it's it has some really old school mentality attached to the way that it's run. And for good or bad, I mean, it's it's obviously very difficult to change things overnight. But generally, you know, it's always the team, right? So you race for that team. Mm. Um, and previously, it's getting better as, you know, riders are, are becoming more aware. But, you know, that rider has to be very cognizant about building his brand, right? Like not just being in that team, but who is who is the Mitch Docker brand and who is the the Mike Woods brand. I mean, who are they as yeah. people, not just always associated with the team that they're racing in? Because over time, they will change, right? Um, the individual will change, but also they change teams. And you, know, you commit so much to this team that ultimately you can only be contracted to for one or four or five years. You move on to another team, suddenly you've got to be with part of that. So I see what you're saying is like, build up your individual brand that doesn't change over all those years and also stays with you after your career. Exactly. 
And so they can be involved as much as they want. They can um, do as little as they want. I mean, a lot of it also, it's, it can become complex because obviously, you know, the team is the one that's sort of paying their salary. Right. So obviously racing is their main focus and, and their day job. So it's a balance of, OK, how much can they do and how much do they want to do? Mm. But at this point in time, I mean, I really understand, you know, focus on your bike racing. It's because you need to do that. Right. You need, they're, these are very highly successful and uh, individuals who still have a lot of their career left and who have not reached their pinnacle. Right. You know, like. Cassie this year, this year won Amstel Gold Race. I mean, Mike. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't really need much much introduction. And, and Edvald. I mean, so these are really high achieving bike riders who still have a lot to give. So they really need to focus on that. But in the meantime, there are also people that, you know, someone like Mike is a very outgoing guy. He loves to be with people. So if he wants to join a group ride and and just meet people. Why not? I mean, that, that's completely up to him. And I think yeah, it's exactly, you've already pointed this fact out. It's, they can choose how much is good for them, but it's never, as you pointed out for you in the very beginning, it wasn't a hindrance for you. It was a positive thing mm. that I think a lot of people, and I always remember when you first started too, I remember hearing those comments around, mm. Scott doesn't know what he's doing, you know, mm. he's just, what is he, is he a pro cyclist, is he working right. in a cafe? But they're never going to understand that fact until they're in it themselves and go, well, hang on, I just sit at home analyzing my files all day and I'm, this guy's actually out there doing something else with his mind. So I think you've sort of tapped into that and now you're allowing other people to tap into that themselves at whatever level they feel comfortable with. Mm. That might be a very bit, little bit at the start and it might end up being something that they really love doing and occupying their minds that ultimately helps them become a, prof- a better professional cyclist. And I also think now... You're starting to see, like, being a bit outside of the professional world um, and seeing a lot about what is cycling at the moment. Mm. Who's starting cycling now? Who are the people getting into cycling? What are they doing? Where they come from? What are their interests? What we're noticing now more and more generally, I find, is that people now starting cycling, it's a different demographic. Totally. And they're not racers. You know, a lot of them are people, you know, that are late 30s, early 40s. You know, cycling is a trendy sport at the moment. Mm. And it's a great sport because it's low impact. It's easy to do. It's social. I mean, there's so many aspects about cycling that make it a great sport. Yeah. Um, But what I'm noticing is that they don't know much about bike racing. You know, they're not coming through racing or clubs or different things. But I feel like that they probably would really love it if they got exposed to it or understood it. Mm. So actually, for us with these riders um, and the service course, we have an opportunity in a way to expose them to bike racing. Mm. In the way that they're going to feel comfortable being exposed yeah. to. Yeah. And meeting pros that you know, are really easy and great people to talk yeah. to you know, and spending a bit of time with them. And actually, what I would love is that, because we've got a couple of things rolling out sort of next year with the service course, and one of those probably will be a sort of a, a team, mm. you know. I prefer not to really consider a club, yeah. you know, more of a, a team. But my thing is, is like, we have the service course, I mean, we have the opportunity to say, hey, look, these are our guys, yeah. you know. Let's support these guys, you know. Let's, let's go to a race Let's go to Hamster Gold and, you know, be there cheering for Cassie up the last climb or Woods or, or let's go to Flanders and cheer on Eddie, mm. you know, and really feel like, you know, he's a part of our, those, those riders are a part of our group, mm. right? And then you feel that you You're can have, a part of them too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You can have like a sort of a connection with that rider more personal than just like, okay, I see him on TV. Mm. You know, when you meet that person once or twice... And then you see them on TV, you're like, holy cow. Like, that person's like riding up this gargantuan mountain yeah. flying. And I just, the other day I was riding with them. You got the personal connection you know? there. It changes and, it. And in that same instance, you know, we can foster a bit of that, that excitement around racing. Because I think that also, not that racing is everything, 
but it is a part of cycling that's mm. very important and it's a part of the heritage of cycling um, and something that's also more over time beginning to suffer you know mm. like races are going away you know teams are struggling more and you know but it might just be that some guy comes on a service course trip for the first time is exposed to bike racing and he might happen to be a very wealthy individual and be like, oh, wow, I didn't even really know about this. This is great. It's just you know? moving with the times, it sounds like. Yeah. You know, so, you know, I would really love to be able to, you know, have that one, have those riders have the opportunity to, to sort of generate their own sort of fan club, you know, and have people support them. And at the same time, you know, let's get a bit of momentum back to exposure to racing and, and having people see how beautiful a, a spring classic is. Or, Let's uh, make racing or, cool again. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, exactly. it's, it's, a, it's a true thing. It is know? because it's like you look, at the, you look at the tradition and I love, I'm a traditionalist too, but with cycling I'm talking about, yep. and I'm the same as you, you love the traditional racing and you love, you know, the gravel stuff. But ultimately it is difficult to understand. It took us years to understand it, but a lot of people don't have time or the interest to get to that level. Mm. So it's like, it's medium halfway. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Give them enough exposure to kind of get into it. But uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I agree. But there's something, something quite special about going to see certain events, you know, that really kind of, you, you can't understand it until you've been there. Like you can't really understand what it's like to be at a, a classic you know, and feel that environment, you know, if it's like the, the last time up the Cal- yeah. Cowberg or something, you've got like thousands of people. It's just like, it's, it's electric, you know? Um, and just that feeling, you don't have to be a bike racing nerd to, to feel, feel that energy. energy. Yeah. You just have to get there. Like yeah. someone has to take you there and say, Hey, look, this is super cool. I think you'd really like this. Um, and it's a real balance about, um, uh, you know, having, you know, we'll organize some more trips around races. But those trips are about, you know what, let's go riding. Like we're doing one this year for the Vuelta. And it's five days. One day is going to see the race. Mm-hmm. Four days is let's go riding. We're having an awesome time. Do some climbs. It's just great. Then one day, let's go see the race, you know, because it's there. And it's about that balance of not saturating them with racing five days yeah. of bike racing you know and after two days third like, day, yeah, yeah you're like so oh, it's boy. about just you know having just sparking that interest enough and having them either they they really love it or maybe they won't but for one day it's still an awesome experience mm. and then you know from them on and then kind of decide if they just want to go around back to that general riding or they want to be more involved with the racing the side. racing side Mate, it's been great touching base with you today and hearing about all the little adventures. I'll be on the Vuelta this year, so yeah, you'll have to come over and say hello. Stage nine, I'll be there. Andorra. Oh, right. Don't come and say hello then. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been great chatting, but um, let's um, keep in touch and keep these brews flowing. It's been a pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. No worries. Cheers, Christian. Thanks for listening again. It was great to hear about the exciting things that have happened for Christian and the service course and the other pros that are getting involved now. If you want to go back and listen to some of those guys I've spoken to, I've actually had a chat with Simon Gerrans and Mike Woods as well. There's some great chats too to get a little bit of insight about what those guys were doing then and now what they're doing with Christian too. It's a great little thing they've got going together now. Be sure to get in touch with us on Instagram or Twitter and show us that merchandise. If you guys have bought some stuff, let me see you in it. I really want to see that. Thanks again for Lara behind the scenes who's helping this roll on. And guys, until next time, stay tuned. Cheers.